Our, our next speaker is Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas. Uh, Governor Hutchinson was born in Bentonville, Arkansas, and he received his law degree from the University of Arkansas, which is just up the road from Bentonville in Fayetteville. If you've ever met someone from Arkansas, they have this thing called Woo Pig Suey. Now, I'm from Texas, and I've never quite figured out what Woo Pig Suey is. Uh, but nevertheless, in 1982, President Reagan appointed Governor Hutchinson as the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Arkansas. At that time, he was 31 years old, and he was then the youngest U.S. Attorney in the nation. He made national headlines by successfully ending a standoff and prosecuting an extremist cult organization. Since then, Governor Hutchinson has gone on to be ma in, to major leadership roles in the DEA, Homeland Security, and most recently, of course, as governor of the great state of Arkansas. I first met Governor Hutchinson in the governor's mansion about five years ago. My firm, First Liberty Institute, is co-counsel with the state of Arkansas in defending a Ten Commandments monument that sits on the Capitol grounds in Little Rock. So you could say that Governor Hutchinson has been fighting for righteous causes ever since he entered public service. It is my great honor to introduce to you and please give a warm Iowa welcome to Governor Asa Hutchinson. I call the hogs now. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be with you today. Hey. Tucker Carlson. Good, to see, Good to see you. Thank you. And we need to explain go hogs and what that means, right? No, this is Iowa. Well, pick <laughs> I, I was at the newspaper in Little Rock 30 years ago, yep. and you were an indelible figure then. You were the in establishment. That. You were the... <laughs> He was an editorial writer for the Arkansas Democrat. Yes, I was. So you were in charge of the world. I had to then. pay zero speeding tickets while I had that job. It was the best. <laughs> it's a great state. Thank you so much for doing this. So I wanted to talk to you about your veto of the anti-puberty blocker trans surgery bill in April of 2021. At the time, you said that the bill was extreme and that it would interfere with the treatment of minor seeking to transition from male to female or female to male. Given, and I'm not attacking you for it, but I am asking if in the subsequent two years you've had rethinking of that. Have you reassessed your view on it since then? Well, uh, first of all, I want to ask, how many of you all are parents in this room? I'm a parent as well. And uh, what I believe in is that parents ought to raise their children. I believe that parents ought to be in control, and I also believe in the Constitution. I believe that God created two genders, and that there should not be any confusion on your gender. But if there is confusion, then parents ought to be the one that guides the children. That to me is an important fundamental principle. Now obviously you could take it too far, and if there would have been a bill that said uh, you uh, should not ever have transgender surgery as a minor, I would sign that in a minute because no parent should be able to consent to that permanent change. But this bill did go too far. It was unconstitutional. It interfered with parents. And so I sided with parents on that bill in, in managing the most sensitive issue that a parent can face. And I believe in a limited role of government. And so, you know, if I don't think that California ought to be able to tell parents, you need to have gender affirming care for the children. The government should not do that. And in the same way, let's keep the government out of it unless it's that extreme case, and let's let parents guide the children. I stand with parents. So, and, and amen for standing with parents, and I think everyone in the room would agree with that. Um, but the reason I asked the question was not to bring up a sore subject, which I, I know that it is, uh, but to ask if in the subsequent two years, you, you had said that you drew the line at castration of, of physical altercation of a child's body because it's permanent. But in the subsequent two years, I think we've learned that hormone therapy for 
prepubescent children is permanent. It changes the bone structure, it changes the brain of the child. It, a lot of people believe, including me, that it, it destroys the child's life, but it is permanent. It's not reversible. So given that and the standard you just articulated, do you have different feelings? I mean, this is a permanent change we are making to a child. Why would we allow that if we don't allow surgery? Well, you, permanent change is one issue, but also hormonal treatment is a different issue and can be a different issue. And whenever you look at the bill that I vetoed, there was not any grandfather clause in there. Again, uh, I respect legislators that have a different view, but I think independently, I think of the parents, I think of the Constitution, and actually the court, if you read the decision of the federal judge that struck it down as unconstitutional, really sided with parents as well. But how, is whenever, it but how is it treatment? I guess that's my question. If you have a child who says, who's born a boy, I want to become a girl, he hasn't gone through puberty yet, he's say 10. Is it treatment to prevent him from going through the natural process of adolescence? How is that treatment? It, it seems not like treatment, it seems like something else. Well, you have to, Tucker, I hope that we'll be able to talk about some issues. I know that- Well, this is one of the biggest issues in the country, and I think I would, every person in this room would agree that it is a, a central issue because it, these are children who are being altered permanently, and you can defend that alteration, that change, if you like, but there's really no debate about whether or not it's permanent. And so I think it's fair to ask you in a calm, rational, and I very much hope polite way, why you would support that. Well, I didn't say what I supported, I said what I vetoed. And whenever you look at, at children and what they're challenged with in life, I think it's important that in the most sensitive issues that parents are able to guide them through that challenge. And so I don't like the schools pushing transgenderism. I don't want the schools, uh, for example, when President Obama issued the uh, order from the Department of Education that you ought to have bathrooms in the schools that uh, the children can choose what their gender is and go to which bathroom they think they are that day. I said that is not consistent with the law. I said that... Uh, Wait, but I'm, I'm I, no, no, I'm, no, no, but no. you said that children should be able to choose their gender and their parents should be able to affirm that and the state has no role in getting involved. So how is that different? You're saying that a child shouldn't be able to choose a bathroom, but he can choose his sex? I don't understand. Let me finish okay. what I Great. said. Let me finish. Oh, I hope you will. If you don't mind. Well, please do. And the finish is that I told Obama they were wrong. I said it publicly that the school districts can ignore that guidance. And so that's where I think this, the, the government should not be pushing an agenda in our schools. And that's what I oppose. And so I want the government to stay out. I want the parents and communities and our faith to guide us through these difficult decisions. And so I'm a, I'm a parent and whenever, uh, I, I think it's very important that if a child goes to a teacher and says, I think I'm a boy, but I think I might ought to be a girl. Well, the school, and they want to do something about it. The parents ought to know about that. And so like New Jersey is totally wrong in suing the school districts that want to be able to tell parents. These are fundamental principles that parents have to have information. They shouldn't be denied the uh, ability to know what's going on in the school with a yes. child. And then they make the decision. They can go to the doctor. If the child is suicidal, if the child is struggling, uh, they want to, uh, they discuss uh, uh, hormonal treatment that would delay puberty. Uh, I don't think this government should come in and tell the parents, you can't give the child a vaccine or you must give the child a vaccine or you cannot give them the treatment that you think is important in discussion. But, with, but so, with and, and I think you're a person of good faith and I'm not attacking your motives at all. I'm just trying to get to what they are. And I, and I will stop with this, but you have repeatedly described delaying a child's natural progression from childhood to adulthood through adolescence, you describe that as, quote, treatment. And so that raises the, I mean, clearly you've answered the question, you believe it's treatment. You believe, I suppose, that people can change their sex. Because if you don't believe that, you wouldn't call it treatment, would you? <laughs> well, the God created two genders, and that's what I have stated. And whenever you look at the decisions on that, no, I don't, 
I don't support that. I wouldn't make that decision in my family yes. about trans and changing genders. And I don't believe that taxpayers' funds should be used for transgender surgery or treatment through Medicaid or Medicare or in our military. Yes. I don't believe that that should happen uh, because uh, traditionally, whether it's the Hyde Amendment that you prohibit funding of abortion with taxpayers' dollars because it violates the religious commitment of many people, the same principle should apply here. I'm saying one simple fundamental thing that we have to have a debate as to what is the limited role of government. Let's encourage parents to make decisions. Uh, obviously, they can go too far and you draw a line and legislatures have to do that. Yes. But that is the reason Arkansas is one of the first states that had to address this and uh, we handled it. Uh, the law has been suspended because it was unconstitutional. Other states have done a better job in it, have redrafted the laws. I haven't read them all, but they have varying dif differing degrees of, uh, uh, of, of changes in it, such as having grandfather clauses where you don't force a parent to take the child out of state uh, whenever they're undergoing treatment. Well, no one would be forcing the child to go out of state. It, the parents would, would make that decision. But um, one of the powers that government did usurp uh, over the past several years is, is the right to decide what medicine you take in the form of, of COVID mandates. Um, how did you feel about that? And how many COVID shots did you take? And how do you feel about it now, in retrospect? How many COVID shots did you take? Zero. But, but I think it's fair, and I, and I could see that you recoiled when I asked you that question. Um, and I don't think, honestly, you should be asking people about their medical care, but that became a, a matter of public policy. And I do think that the whole country ought to pause and assess, like, what did we just go through? Well, How do we feel about it now? And so it's a very sure. straightforward question. Well, I'll give you a straightforward okay. answer on a, a number of points there. Uh, first of all, uh, in Arkansas, we had no governmental mandates. In fact, we passed a law, that, which I signed, that prohibited government from mandating uh, the vaccine to be taken by government employees. Bless and, you. And whenever the... And whenever the uh, Biden administration said that even the National Guard had to take the vaccine, I called my adjutant general in and I said, make sure that you broadly interpret every exemption. We don't want to lose National Guard personnel uh, because of their refusal to take a vaccine. And then, of course, Arkansas joined in the litigation challenging that from the Biden administration because whenever you're looking at the vaccine, it should be individual choice. We shouldn't be firing people uh, from government because uh, they make that individual decision. Yes, I took the vaccine and I also per I went out and held town hall meetings uh, where we brought in medical testimony and, and local doctors and talked in the community about it. So I think we made the right, I mean, I made the right decision taking the vaccine for me, but, uh, but other people can make a different decision. For sure, but do you think that now, um, what do you make of the evidence that there were an awful lot of people injured by it? I think, well, that's factually true. And it does seem like there is intense pressure not to mention that. And so if we care about people, we should also care about people who are injured by a drug they were coerced into taking. Why, why is there no conversation about that? Well, I think there is conversations about that, but let me talk I don't about think so. the pandemic a, a little bit more. There were two, some decisions were not perfect. Uh, I had to make the best judgments I could during the pandemic. And as a governor, I made two decisions I think were very important. One of them was that whenever you look at the businesses. There was enormous national pressure to say, you're an essential business, you're a non-essential business. Non-essential businesses have to close down. I looked at that and I said that every business uh, that provides a job for a family is an essential business. And I'm gonna keep them open. And the second, and because of that, our economy recovered uh, we, I, we didn't shelter in place, which were one of few states that made that decision. The other one was, uh, I kept our schools open after that spring where we all went virtual. I said, this is not working, particularly in a rural state. 
and as a result of keeping our schools open for in-classroom instruction, Arkansas ranked number two in the nation for days of in-classroom instruction during the pandemic. That was good for the students, it was good for our communities, it was diminished the learning gap, and so we don't handle things perfectly, but we make good judgments, and those were two that I think will stand the test of time. So I want to ask you a question that Senator Scott and uh, that I asked Senator Scott, uh, which is, do you think, and, and would you as president, use the U.S. military to seal our southern border? Well, it, it's very important that we use our military to support uh, our protection of the southern border. Uh, there's, what I would do in approaching the southern border, and of course I was in charge of border security during the Bush administration, yes, I know. Yep. and as some people might remember, we didn't get it perfect, but it looks perfect compared to what you see today. For sure. And uh, so I have a little bit of experience along the border security. I was head of the DEA, and so I had to deal with Mexico in reference to the cartels. And that is probably the number one thing that is important, is to address the cartels to declare them foreign terrorist organizations that harm Americans, that cause a great deal of human suffering, and are responsible for bringing fentanyl in that's killing our citizens and our young people. Yes. And so the southern border, we need to increase our borders uh, resources with our border patrol. We need to build the infrastructure, including continuing the wall, but we also need to have technology that supports uh, the uh, protection of our border. We need to reform our asylum laws, and then we have to go after the cartels. A very specific plan as to how to bring security to the southern border. Uh, I, immigration's important to our country. Yes. And uh, we're a land of immigrants, uh, and we want to cherish that, and we don't want to lose that. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we protect our border from a security standpoint, and from a sovereignty standpoint, that defines a sovereign nation whenever we can control our borders. Amen. And I think most people, I think most people agree with that or say they agree with it. But just to more precise action questions. So we have U.S. military personnel in over 100 bases around the world. The president, as you saw yesterday, mobilized some reserves um, to support the effort against Russia in Eastern Europe. Why wouldn't you use uniformed, I, and maybe, I mean, you, you ran the agency, so you may know the answer, and I'm, I'm ignorant, but, but why wouldn't you just create a human wall of American military personnel and just kind of fix the problem immediately? We could afford to do that. We don't want to do that for some reason. What am I missing? Well, a couple points there. Uh, first of all, uh, the military is always an option that might be needed at some point but I want to be able to fix it without having to How use How about when military. 7 million people come in? Is that the point? I would like to be able to do it without using the military for a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to show strength with China and making sure we have a military presence in the Philippines. Uh, we want to make sure that we show strength in Europe and that we're able to maintain a military that has a global presence. And so the military has a lot of responsibilities. Secondly, the military... Uh, may I ask you to pause? Are well, those responsibilities more important than protecting our own borders? I'm going to finish my answer first. Uh, the second reason is the military is trained to kill people. Uh, and it is, they're not trained in traditional law enforcement responsibilities. So it's a different mission. We utilize the National Guard, but our, our regular military, I hope we don't have to use in the border, that we can solve the problem without that. Now go ahead. Okay, but if you have, if I describe to you a nation in which seven million people had moved without permission, most of them military age males, and bringing with them they brought poison that killed over 100,000 citizens of the country into which they were moving every single year, you would say this is an invasion, this is not only a challenge to a sovereignty, this is proof that sovereignty doesn't exist. You don't control your country. It's not really your country. And you would say that's an emergency. In fact, you might even say that's worse than what's happening in Ukraine right now from an American perspective. And so what, if that doesn't meet the definition of an emergency with which you'd use the US military to respond, then what does? What's happening in the Philippines? I mean, I'm not mocking you, but what is happening in the Philippines that's more important than that? Well, 
the Philippines is close to Taiwan, and so that sends a signal, of course, that fact that we have our bases there, that if we have the right personnel, uh, the right equipment there, then we send a signal to China, don't touch the freedom of Taiwan. And I think that's important. Uh, but in, in terms of what is important, obviously, uh, whenever you look at the Trump administration, they took steps along the border, but they didn't put the military personnel no, there. And, and whenever you look at how we can solve that problem, if we can solve that problem short of it, there could be, you know, there's some candidates that advocate using the military to bomb uh, the uh, labs in Mexico. Well, that is called an invasion, and I'd like to be able to do something short of invading a neighboring friendly country, uh, and there's ways to do it. I've worked as the head of the DEA with President Vincente Fox at the time to dismantle one of the cartels. Uh, and we can do it again. We've got to use economic pressure on Mexico in order to be successful in targeting the cartels. This last week was extraordinary. Down in Mexico, you're seeing them use uh, roadway bombs, the cartels, and it wound up killing civilians. Mexico has to wake up to the threat to their country and to their economy and to their citizens from the unleashed uh, power of those cartels. The United States needs to support that and pressure Mexico if they're not going to cooperate. I'm, I'm a little confused by the orientation. So, of course, there is a drug war ongoing in Mexico. It's been going on since you were um, involved in government. But it's the carnage in the United States that I think most Americans are worried about. So you just described Mexico as a friendly country and we need to help Mexico get the drug cartels under control because they're killing people in Mexico. But they're also killing hundreds of thousands of people here and nobody seems to care. So we can argue about you know, what the policy solutions are, but it's, it's the emphasis that I think is very striking to a lot of voters. Like, where's the outrage? 100,000 people die of poison sent through Mexico and like, we call them a friendly country? I don't understand. Well, you haven't been to my town hall meetings, which- No, no, but I'm offering I, you a chance. Which, it, well, in which I talk about the fentanyl crisis in our cities. And Tucker, you're absolutely right. Whenever I have a uh, friend that I call up who's in New York City, but he's from Arkansas, and I call him up, talk about a political question, my campaign actually, and uh, I say, what are you doing in New York? And he said, my son, who is a college age student, went to go watch a baseball game in New York. He goes out in the street, as he should not have done, to buy, and he bought a Percocet pill. Yes. And the Percocet pill was laced with fentanyl. And he overdosed and he died, and uh. so the dad was there to pick up and recover the body. And so fentanyl is a crisis. It's the uh, number one cause of death between those ages 18 and 49 yes. in America. So it is a crisis, it is serious, and it has to be addressed both with going after the cartels, controlling the border, but it's also about what Governor Kim Reynolds did uh, here in Iowa and, and had a fentanyl conference, which I attended, in which parents who had been impacted were trying to educate others about the danger of illicit drugs, particularly fentanyl, and how they can be laced with other drugs. That's the kind of education we, effort we need here. It's about uh, addiction counseling as well, and families struggle with this. I've struggled with this. And so, yes, it is something that I take very, very seriously. Yes. I'm passionate about, I'm outraged about. Amen. When you pray, what do you pray for? You know, great question. I heard your interview, it was really great today uh, with uh, Bob Vander Plaats, and I, I saw that you got to Deuteronomy. Yeah, that's, I've only gotten there, <laughs> but I'm pretty psyched well, for judges, I'll tell well, you that. When you, get, <laughs> when, you, when you get to James, you, you asked me what I prayed for, there you go, Bob. Uh, <clears throat> I pray for wisdom. In James, uh, it talks about if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And uh, that's the old King James Version I know. And upbraideth not is like a child that's coming to a parent and saying, can I have uh, something? And you fuss at them. God never fusses at us or upbraids us for asking for wisdom. So I pray for two things. One, that I'll be a good steward of God's blessings to me, yes. which are the opportunities in public service. 
and secondly, that he'll give me wisdom. And there's human wisdom that understands the affairs of man that Daniel and David were so wise in. But then there's also the eternal wisdom, the wisdom that we can see our lives through the lens of eternity and recognize that the votes that I cast, the vetoes that I do, it's not just a matter of uh, accountability in history or with your constituents, but we're accountable as believers in eternity. And so I ask for the wisdom to have an eternal perspective, uh, the biblical worldview that's important to me, uh, that I learned at Bob Jones University, uh, that I learned uh, at, at the Religious Freedom Conference at the University of Notre Dame, which Francis Shaver uh, spoke. Uh, and I put that into practice in my life uh, as a young lawyer before I was the youngest U.S. attorney. We started a Christian radio station, the first FM radio station in Bentonville, Arkansas, in which we had James Dobson, we had, we had uh, John MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll on there. We believed in that Christian ministry in our community. We started a Christian school before school choice was the movement of the country because I wanted to make sure my children had those different options. And so that's how I put wisdom to apply in my life, personally, but also in the public arena. That's, that's the best thing to pray for. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Governor. You. Great to see you. I got to say one more thing. Yes, please. All right, I heard you say, Bob, that I can do this. First of all, I want to congratulate Governor Reynolds and the legislature for the heartbeat bill that's going to be signed today. Arkansas has been ranked as the number one pro-life state in the nation. I'm proud of that. We want to protect the unborn child. But I also wanted to say that uh, all kinds of people here with different backgrounds, you've got different candidates as a, as a, as a favorite. Uh, I want to get on the debate stage. I think you want a robust debate. I want the people of Iowa to make the first cut on who's going to be the presidential nominee. And so help us get on the debate stage. My website is asa2024.com. And if everybody in this room uh, gave a dollar and then told 10 people to give a dollar, you'll get me on the debate stage. I'll give Iowa all the credit. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you again. Thank you.